Welcome one and all to Last Stop Penn Station podcast featuring Carrie Silken and Ian Riccoboni. They dive deep into Carrie's wealth of stories and no subject is off limits. From the world of wrestling to his ticket agency, growing up in New Jersey, drug-fueled underground days, hustling in the French Quarter of New Orleans, and endless days and nights in New York City, every story is worth telling. Welcome, everyone. It is episode three, season two, Last Stop Penn Station. I'm Ian Riccoboni. And Carrie, we got so much tremendous feedback. We are recording more or less in real time now. So we used to say that as kind of an in-joke, but recording this on a Tuesday and uh, talking about celebrating the life of Larry Sweeney. And, and so many people reached out and enjoyed the uh, the episode. Yeah, um, I was hoping it would turn out well, and I really think it did. Um, and it was a tribute in the end. Um, I felt like my comments might be a little dark, but uh, part of the, you know, it was part of the story. And uh, I spoke to a few people afterwards, including our executive producer, mm -hmm. including uh, Jigsaw. And uh, uh, I, believe, I believe you spoke to Todd Sinclair. I did, yeah. And everybody, uh, everybody enjoyed it. So. Once again, uh, we love you, Larry. Yeah, we especially want to keep your, your memory alive. Um, there's going to be, a, I think the realization I came to is there's a generation of fans right now that may have only started watching Ring of Honor, WWE, or AEW within the last couple of years. And Larry's one of those guys at this point where if, if we don't keep bringing up his name and reminding folks of what a special talent he was, he might fade away. And that's, that's a little scary. Yeah, and I sent I sent the podcast to uh, some of my uh, older wrestling friends. One of them being Kevin Sullivan, who doesn't know him, but he really enjoyed listening to it. Mm -hmm. And I forgot that Bushwhacker Luke had been on some shows with him. Yeah, you have the and, great photo together, right? And he, yeah. Luke was like, "Oh, what a lovely guy! What a shame!" And uh, so, yeah, we'll keep his memory alive. He was in it. Sweeney was in a real in-between period. Uh, so the the old school fans didn't know him. The new the younger fans may have heard about him, but uh keeping his memory alive. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of this podcast is is doing that. And today we have a fun one. You know, last week it was it was a little tough for you know the folks we reached out to. And, um, you know, I didn't even know him that well. I met him once. Actually, I didn't know him at all. And, uh, you know, it was even tough for me. I, I know it was, it was a strain for you. But today we're going to go on the lighter side of things. And these have been the people episodes. Uh, there's a guy named Bill you were telling me about and a guy named Ronnie. And yes. uh, that's who we're going to be talking about today, Bill and Ronnie. Well, we're mainly going to be well, we're going to be they're included. Bill is uh, Billy McKim, who. I'm eternally grateful for because in my time of working the streets and cleaning up my act in 1991, uh, one of the times I cleaned up my act, but this was like the first time I really made a serious effort to uh, put down some substances. And I, I wanted to get off the street. Um, even though I was making good money, I was sick and tired of uh, being out there with these hustle with the with the other scalpers, and I would have rather have gone into an office environment and potentially been on the phones, which I w wasn't like I was going to go off the street and just get on the phones. Bill had a very busy office. Uh, now we're talking 1991 here. So and boys and girls, no internet. Yeah. So events would go on sale, whether it was U2, whether it was uh, Black Sabbath, whether it was Rush, uh, whomever it was, whether it was, 
you know, ooh, the, the Knicks are going to be in the playoffs. Yeah, they started to get great around that time. Right. Yeah. And uh, just or just people wanted good seats for a ball game or to see Michael Jordan. Right. Or, you Gretzky, know, probably. Gretzky, of course, yeah. with Gretzky and, you know, to, you know, Broadway, which has been good to me over the years. Um, Bill was on top of Broadway. And uh, at that time, Phantom of the Opera was red hot mm -hmm. and Miss Saigon was red hot. Hmm. So Bill was kind enough to give me a hello, Lamb Chop. Give me a <laughs> give me a chance. And in the beginning, what I would do was I would uh, come to the office. And there was this other guy, Ronnie, who worked there now. Ronnie, you know those stores you see in Times Square to this day that are all like the electronic stores <laughs> yeah. that are always going out of business? Right. Perpetually, yes. Right. Yeah. 75% off everything <laughs> this week, doors closing. That was his, his, his family's hustle. Oh. And somehow Ronnie morphed into tickets and you might possibly be familiar but route 22 in new in, in union mm -hmm. come at union springfield there was a lot of car dealerships right and somehow ronnie had uh some ticket he was buying and selling tickets on his own and he had some customers you know money was abundant in this time and uh bill's office Union tickets was right on Route 22. Oh. So Ronnie stopped in one day and, uh, you know, R Ronnie, uh, he comes out of the uh, comes out of the same loins as the great Uncle Gunny. You know, <laughs> he could sell anything. He could sell anything. But he wasn't the most. You know, and so Bill had him come in. The phones were busy. And Bill put a lot of money into advertising. It was all, you know, Yellow Pages, newspapers. Mm -hmm. And Billy was really sharp and the office was busy. But one of the problems was that Ronnie was not quite, uh, and, and Billy was an honest guy and he was a, a, good, a good hustler, but Ronnie, he would sell things that didn't exist <laughs> or sell things <laughs> that did exist but sell them five times. <laughs> so was he was he making up bogus shows or in events? Well, or? people would call up, um, and you know, let's say uh, Rush was at the Meadowlands, and Bruce had four shows at the Garden, and the office certainly had physical tickets. Mm -hmm. But let's say for the Rush show, they had six seats that were legitimate fourth row centers. Well, you can only sell them, sell them <laughs> once right. in a combination of six people. Ronnie had no compunction about selling them a dozen times. Wow. And Bill's going to hear this. I still communicate with Bill. And, and Bill would, would probably be nodding his head and laughing. <laughs> Because Bill sort of let this go on. He would yell at Ronnie, what are you doing? You know, we sold the rush. How are you going to, you know, Ronnie, Ronnie was always like, oh, we'll fill these orders. We'll fill these orders. With whose ticket? Well, you'll, you'll, he was hoping there'll be a release. Mm. And now you have some eighth throws and you tell the people that were supposed to get fourth throws, look, we got eighth throws. We'll yeah. save you 25 a ticket, blah, blah, blah. So. That was his game. And also with Broadway, when a Broadway show is hot, and even still to this day, um, you, you were able to call the treasurers. The tre at the, each theater had what they called a treasurer. Mm. Should have been called a crook. <laughs> and they would hold back tickets huh. so that you, you, would, you would, I remember, uh, Certain guys had connections. Now, Ronnie didn't have direct connections, mm -hmm. but certain old school guys had connections with the theater. So if you had an advanced order for, let's say, oh, 
for Phantom of the Operas for Thursday, three weeks from now. You're going to give them the, you tell the people the first 10, you're going to get the first 10 row center. You know, this is going back 91. Even then, you know, they're going to be 200 each. And they say, all right, I'll take them. Uh, you could call the treasurer and almost all the time, they would confirm it like three or four days ahead of time. Mm. Sometimes on an off night, like a Thursday or Tuesday, they would say, yeah, you're good. Mm. But when it got to the holiday season, yeah. Or it got to that the show was really, really hot. They would have to confirm it like a couple days ahead of time. So if you were doing the right thing, you would tell the customer, look, um, do you, you want to go to see Miss Saigon uh, on that Saturday night? We'll take your order, but we're not going to know till the Thursday before. Is that OK with you? Mm -hmm. And if the person said yes, and uh, that's our first story. Yeah, <laughs> the str the strange tale of uh, let me pronounce his name properly, E. Girk. E. Girk. e period. <laughs> Girk. G U R K K. <laughs> okay. Before we get to that, I have some questions. <laughs> okay. I, have a lot, I have a lot of questions, but I'll keep it limited. Um, uh, let's talk about your background, how you came to the office job. Any college experience? College? <laughs> any? Yes. Okay. I had yep. uh, one uh, a, a semester and a half at uh, Union Union College in Cranford, New Jersey, majoring in in pinball. There you go. And joint rolling. That's right. We talked about that on the right. uh, Empire Industries episode. Okay. And uh, how about your colleagues? <laughs> Do you know uh, if they had any? No. no. It was just, it was straight hustling. Okay. Straight hustling. Um, I also mentioned in the last episode, and you chuckled, the great Dirty Bert. <laughs> that was like Billy. <laughs> Billy's uh, like it was like a cousin or something. Uh, whatever. So the phone staff at Union, there was, there was a girl. Oh, I can't think of her name. But uh, there was like a secretary type. Billy's sister, Mary, was there. And Ronnie was the main salesman. And one of Billy's friends, Mark Crumper, who I saw at one of our WrestleMania events. Oh, wow. And a good guy. Um, he would come in sometimes for big events like the Stones or, you know, Bruce. And um, Bill's father, another good man, uh, he went under the name of Jim at the office. I think his name was Bill. Uh, he would be in there and, uh, it's a, it was a ragtag staff. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like an early Bruce Springsteen song at this point, <laughs> the, right. the ragamuffin gunner and the, <laughs> right. It was a ragtag staff. Um, and the, the office was once again, it was on route 22 and it had a, an entrance way, like people could come in to pick up tickets hmm. and, but you couldn't come in the office. There was sort of like a, uh, you know, there was a buzzer. And they came into a small corridor, which will lead into another story of which two of our most beloved characters of the previous season, Pig Face Stanley and Little Scotty, his son, the baboon. Oh, when wow. they came there trying to unload a bunch of Phantom of the Opera tickets. But let's get back to e e Do you have Kirk. any more questions? <laughs> Wait, do we, uh, that's an unusual name. It was it was E short or is this a Harry S. Truman situation where it was uh, S was the <laughs> E? That's that's just not e relevant to the <laughs> E. Kirk. Um, I heard mistake. Ronnie a number of times. Yes, Mr. Kirk. Well, what happened with E. Kirk was this. E. Kirk lived in Fargo, North Dakota. It's North Dakota, right? It is, yeah. yeah. It's uh, in the southeast corridor. Of okay. North Dakota, yeah. And Broadway theater, uh, traditionally and still, well, not right now, but traditionally gets really hot um, the week, the weeks leading up to Christmas because people come to New York, Christmas shopping, mm -hmm. uh, go see, uh, you know. 80s town. Go, go see, right, go to see a show, go see uh, the... Uh, the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Center, Center mm -hmm. and the Christmas show at Radio City. And, uh, you know, Christmas in New York is very romantic. Mm -hmm. So Eager called well in advance. But don't forget, as I told you, 
uh, certain shows were hot. You didn't get the okay. So he wanted to see the hottest new Broadway show. He said it was his dream. His young daughter was really interested in theater. And she wanted to go see Miss Saigon, which had come out, might have won the Tony Award. I don't know, but it wasn't out very long. And uh, so he wanted it for like the first Saturday night in December, which is always considered a really hot weekend because as the Saturdays and, you know, Thanksgiving weekend's hot, first weekend and second weekend in December are hot. And then as it gets a little closer to Christmas, people are sort of getting ready for Christmas. But those two two weekends, the first two weekends of December, for all these events, even whether it was Ranger Games, whether mm -hmm. it was a, a concert and Broadway, even the shows that weren't that hot had, you know, their best run. So E. Girk wanted, it was another problem. He wanted an odd lot, which <laughs> is, he wanted three tickets. Oh. It was it was for his daughter, yeah. himself, and his wife. Okay. Well, Ronnie told him, no problem. Uh, I think E. Girk ordered. Now, I'm, I'm just overhearing this whole thing <laughs> the whole time because I would come in and I'd be, you know, they, I'd be on the phone maybe for an hour or two. And then they would have me go to the city with their deliveries. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, drop offs at hotels. Mm -hmm. And I also would take the extra tickets if they had extra tickets for which. And I was really over the street selling at that point, but I would do it and you'd, you'd, you'd make good money. And Billy would buy a lot of seats. Um, so eager quarters, the tickets and Ronnie calls in the order and the guy at the, once again, he wasn't talking directly to the theater, but he calls mm -hmm. one of these old time brokers, but, and the old time broker tells him, listen, uh, they're not going to get back to us till the Thursday before. That's, you know, the first Saturday night uh, you know, of December. Right. So Ronnie knew that. But would he tell E. Girk that? <laughs> no. <laughs> so <laughs> as the as the days, as the weeks and days are going on, E. Girk just seemed to call like at a regular time when wow. I was there, like 1130 in the morning. Not every day, but. But Ronnie's telling him the FedEx is going out. Oh, no. <laughs> right. Now it's coming to like two weeks before the show, you know, and uh, the guy's getting nervous. Ronnie's telling him, oh, I have to go up to the shipping department. There was no shipping <laughs> department. <laughs> so, you know, Billy would get upset. Billy would run out. Like, oh, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. You know, we got it. How are you going to fill this Good order? For Billy. And, and, and Billy. right. And yeah. then Ronnie would be like, you know, <laughs> one of Ronnie's, when Ronnie would, would never would get too flustered, but once, like, after about the 19th time E. Girk politely <laughs> called, I remember like, Ronnie is like, say, I've told you I'm going to the ship, shipping department. I'll call you back. And Ronnie slams down the phone. He goes, up his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, Our good friend Danhausen would love it. Up, right, up yours, yeah. Right, up yours. Yeah. So, I also heard the oddball thing. Ronnie, he was a little over. He was, you know, probably had an extra 40, 50 pounds on him. And his wife was bugging him. You know those rice cakes? Yeah. yeah. She's like, here, he, he's throwing oh, rice. Like, poor. these goddamn rice cakes. He was like the, throwing them down. Anyway. It's coming to the week of the show. Mm -hmm. And now Egurk's calling. And like for me, I'm already like, whatever. Um, what happened was it was the Wednesday before the Saturday. You'd figure Egurk would have been in town already. You'd, you'd think. Ronnie's yeah. on the phone with him. And Egurk's like, you know, and I I wish I could have heard the other side. <laughs> the, the man was very demure. From what I could tell Ronnie, he was been like, um, uh, Ronnie, um, I still haven't received the package. And that's when we found out that Egurk. So Ronnie says, look, I'll leave the tickets at your hotel, which he still didn't have them yet. Yeah. And he says, where are you staying? And Egurk said, we're not staying. He goes, are you 
we're not staying at a hotel. He says, are you, are you uh, with, with friends or relatives? He said, no, we're taking the Greyhound, leaving Wednesday night. What? And it, was, it wasn't even, there was no such thing as an express. Right. <laughs> so they're, they're meandering <laughs> through, <laughs> through <laughs> with, like with connected Con- Chicago. Wisconsin and, yeah. oh my. and Minnesota <laughs> yeah. going up and down. And they were actually arriving at Port Authority on Saturday at around 2 p.m. And they were, and he, and, I learned this later from Ronnie and they were, they were taking the 1130 PM Greyhound oh. back, oh, <laughs> back to Fargo. So oh, we God. had a drop off spot, which was commonly used. There were, there was a couple of legendary drop off spots in, in New York city. Um, ticket, uh, ticket lore. Um, there was McHale's was a steakhouse on 46 and 8th. Okay. And there was dozens of brokers would leave envelopes. Uh, it was right in the heart of the theater district. Mm-hmm. Um, why McHale's would want to put up with this? Because I, I guess the theory was people would come in there. They would tip the bartender a couple of bucks. Yeah. But often there were so many envelopes because there was like 40, 50 brokers. Wow. Like where's, you know. Uh, where's Mr. McClay's ticket? So they mm-hmm. haven't come. So the bartender who's busy anyway, they're not here yet. They're not here. Mm-hmm. So Bill and Ronnie found their own spot so they could get away from the chaos and the chaos. And that was Johnny's Italian restaurant, which has some good stories to it, which was on 45th street between um, 6th Avenue and Broadway. And Johnny was uh, eh, slightly connected, let's say. Okay. And uh, it, it was, it was off the, it was, you know, away from Times Square. But the main point was, was that nobody else's tickets were there. Mm-hmm. So I would always go there with a pile of seats. I got to know the bartenders. Mm-hmm. And um, well, what it came down to with E. Gurk was, Listen, Mr. Girk, there will be three tickets for you at, since, since we have nowhere to leave them. And we apologize that FedEx messed up your delivery. <laughs> About six weeks. <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave the three tickets for you. So now I'm involved. Oh. Because I'm, there was that day, there was a lot of deliveries and there were a lot of pickups mm-hmm. at Johnny's. And I, you know, I got along with Ronnie, but I'm like, dude, I don't want to be here when this, you know, what are you going to give me, Gurk? <laughs> well, do you, do they cut you in on, on no. sale? Okay. No, All right. no. Sometimes when I go to a hotel, I deliver tickets. Instead of dropping them off at the desk, mm-hmm. I used to call the room and just say to the guy, it's a $20 delivery charge. So ah. <laughs> sometimes they gave it to you. Sometimes no, they usually just gave it to you. Yeah. But, and then Bill would call me, stop asking for the fucking $20. <laughs> I'll give it to you. So anyway, it came down to that fateful Saturday and I go in there to pick up the envelopes at union to take to New York. Mm-hmm. And there's still no envelope for E. Gurk. Oh. Ronnie told me, He's FedEx. No, <laughs> that he's getting them from this broker and that broker, and there'll be an envelope there with three tickets. I go, I don't want to run into this guy. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really want to run into anybody. Yeah. Because you never knew what they would give them because mm-hmm. of Ronnie. Right. Most people <laughs> got even, their seats. I hadn't even thought of that. <laughs> but the, you never knew. So anyway, I'm in the office. I'm in, I'm in the restaurant. And- Another runner from a ticket agency. It might have been the legendary Agars, which was a famous uh, big time broker, dropped an envelope off. And I, I say to the one of the, the bartenders, it was AB, I go, let me see that. And he goes, and it said E period Girk. Wow. I didn't open it. Yeah. I didn't look. Right. So I'm like, good. 
I'm out of here. Yeah. Right. Cause I, there was a couple of seats to sell on the street mm -hmm. and I'm done. So I leave. That's it. Um, the next week rolls on. There's no ruffles. There's no nothing. And then I think it might've been on Thursday of the next week or Friday. It wasn't a phone call. It was a letter. Oh. And it was from E. Kirk. Oh, no. And the letter said something of the following. Ronnie, thank you for getting us the three tickets for Miss Saigon. It would have been nicer if the three seats would have been together. No. <laughs> <laughs> I sat in the upper right balcony, oh, no. allowing my wife to sit in the mezzanine. And I let my daughter take the, it was a lousy orchestra seat. The, he made it sound like it was a previous seat. Orchestra seat, road double X. Oh, poor E. Garrick. <laughs> he, goes, he goes, I know it must have been difficult to get these. Unfortunately, we didn't make it through the whole show. We didn't make it through the whole show. During the intermission, my daughter frantically ran up to find me and told me, <laughs> told me, Dad, the man sitting next to me was going on a Roman holiday. And I'm like, what's that? Apparently the guy was roaming up and down her leg. Oh no. <laughs> he said, Oh God. <laughs> he said, he oh said, Jesus. Once again, wow. thank you for your effort. We will never be returning to New York nor using oh. your services. Sincerely eager. <laughs> That's how I knew his name was E period. Oh, and Ronnie laughed. Look at this. Up his ass. Uh, up Ronnie's <laughs> ass. I know. That's, that's, that's what I have to say. Jeez. Oh, that's the sad tale yeah. of E. Girk. Oh, poor E. Girk. <laughs> I mean, he's got to he's gotta be out there somewhere. E. e. Girk, if you ever want to come to Ring of Honor, it's right. on me. I, I don't know if that's any consolation. We'll hook you up. Right. We'll do something. I don't know. Or, 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 or communicate with me. Yeah. When tickets are back. I'll send you to whatever you want. There you go. And uh, yeah, then there was another uh, odd incident in the, in the, well, this happened. Oh, this was in the heart of Michael Jordan. Now I had been doing the deliveries and mm. eventually Billy was kind enough to let me work the phones. And I was making a lot less money. Is that any kind of promotion within the well, hierarchy? Yes. Okay. Because I didn't, they got someone else to do, I would get like, I would get some of these street vagabonds. It was always hard to get someone to do the deliveries. Sometimes I still had to go do them. There was the, the great Ralph the Mummy, oh. who was in the Big Nipple Theater. <laughs> yes. He held down the delivery post. Wow. For about a week. <laughs> then there was another guy, Radio John, mm -hmm. um, who we'll have some stories on. Uh, he was a, but these guys couldn't handle it. And another thing about the deliveries was like, Ronnie would be like, can you run over and buy, like, buy such and such, uh, buy, buy two cats tickets for next Wednesday, like out of the window, you know, mm -hmm. something that you could buy. Anyway. There was this woman, Helen Economu. Like <laughs> economy, but like a like the sound e, of e C O N M O O. Okay. Like a like a cheap cow noise. Econo moo. Moo. Okay. <laughs> well, she contacted the office. And uh what was Jordan's last year? Uh, 93 was the year he, he won the beats. So I in the worked finals. for Bill in the office, 91 and 92. Mm -hmm. So it had to be in 92 and they were red hot. Yeah. So Helen Economou, she didn't even want to get tickets for herself. She wanted to get tickets for her ailing grandparents oh. who were <laughs> diehard lifetime basketball fans. Wow. And they were, I remember this, they were um, staying at like a uh, assisted living kind of place. The, uh, the, um, 
the grandmother, this came, this will come up later. Uh, the grandmother had vision problems and the grandfather had just had a hip replacement. Oh. Right. So they really couldn't like move around. Yeah. Like, well, tickets to see the Knicks Bulls with Michael Jordan right. at Madison Square Garden were legit like $300 a piece wow. just to get in the door. There was only like one or two games yeah. to see Jordan. Right. Sure, you could go see the Minnesota Timberwolves. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it might be 40 bucks you get mm-hmm. in the door. Anyway, tell an economist who says, I can't afford $600. Yeah. So Ronnie's like, look, if you bring them to see the Nets at the Continental. No. That's only going to be like eighty five a ticket oh, okay. for upper level. I oh, wow, that's a lot better than. <laughs> I think you're going to say if you bring them to the Nets at the Garden, you could so, pretend, you could pass it off as Michael Jordan. So Helen Economou <laughs> says, okay, but you know they have a lot of physical problems. My grandmother can barely see, and my grandfather can barely walk. Are they going to be good seats? He's like, well, you know, if you're looking for lower levels. You know, if it was the Knicks, the Garden lower levels would be five hundred. Yeah. The Nets, and it it was pr- sort of a legitimate number, would it, are going to cost you two hundred? She says, mm-hmm. "I don't have that kind of money. Mm-hmm. First of all, I have to ambu care them in. Oh my goodness! And it yeah. was expensive enough. I think they were like in Nassau County. So just to get them from Nassau County to wow. uh, the Garden, yeah. But now to go to New Jersey, yeah. So th- that was additional fees." So Ronnie's like, look, 85 each, I'll do the best I can. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you've been to the Continental because we talked about it in uh, the ZZ. ZZ Top. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen Bruce Springsteen there. Yeah. No, he did not get them separate seats. Okay. But what happened was whatever the last row of the upper level was like row 29 (laughs) like section 201 row 29 was the last row and so once again helen couldn't between the expense of getting them there yeah the expense of the tickets she did she did go to the event but not in the event Oh, she was like just a chaperone. Says, right. I'll yeah. just get you in, right? Yeah. Well, they got their tickets. Okay. And in they went. And uh we I I, I heard this on a phone call from her later, because I was the one that answered the phone where she was complaining. Oh no. <laughs> what happened was they got the tickets, they go into the Meadowlands. Well, the grandmother, she had vision problems, but she was spry (laughs) and she was excited and and she she took off and the grandfather's like, hold on, ma. Right, because he can barely move. Yeah. Just had the hip, re- the hip replacement. So now he's got to walk up twenty. Besides just oh, getting in the metal no. land, he had to walk up twenty nine stairs. You know, flights to get into the metal land oh. to get up to the seats. And those were and those were designed so steep too. Those old those old concrete <laughs> stadiums are they're steep. They're the pins popped out. Oh no! Oh <laughs> god! Pin, <laughs> I'm from the hip place. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if they completely popped out. Yeah, but he was unable oh, no. <laughs> to, to join <laughs> to join his wife. Now don't forget, she had the vision problems and. She she yelled out, Paul. Oh, no. <laughs> These poor people. This is all his fault. This is all, He sold these junk tickets. He's, 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 oh. he, well, one of the ushers, one of the kind ushers, uh, was able to help the grandfather. Unfortunately, he was unable to see the game oh. because... Oh, he couldn't. He, he couldn't stand. Oh. They tried to say, "Look, we'll put you in a chair." You know, like yeah. they have those handicap. Sure, yeah. Right, they should have got those handicap seats, like right. behind the lower level. Yeah. So, um, Helen Economou, uh, the grandmother, got to see the game. Oh, 
Well, Helen, again, if your family ever wants to come out, you know, if you think, if uh, it's been it's been about thirty years, but we're ready to make make amends and and fill in for oh for, for union ticket. Well, it was Ronnie. It was Ronnie. Yeah, we're we're ready to make good on on Ronnie. How are we doing doing with time on this one? <laughs> well, we might as well tell the last union ticket story. Uh, I mean, there's more. Yeah, but uh, Pig Face Stanley. Yeah. And Scotty the Baboon. The big return. Yes. Uh, last time we spoke about them, they were standing on line for those misguided Dustin Hoffman Merchant of Venice tickets. <laughs> <laughs> Screaming at the people online who were legitimate fans. Come on, bitch. Buy the seats. Come on, you hawk. This is of all the people, Pigface Stanley. You know, we I, I harp about how mean these names are, and this is that. This one, it just he just seems like such a miserable human being. That's the one that I'm. <laughs> well, I don't know. I did tell. I think I did tell the story of one of my other ticket broker friends who. Yeah, I, we did tell the last time when Pigface was hanging out the window. Yeah. In his, in his, you know, that was in the 60s. But anyway, right. so I mentioned before that Union Tickets had the little office where the people could get buzzed into. Well, Bill was no dummy. Um, at that time, there were some ticket, uh, I don't know, scandals. You know, there were ticket rules and... Mm -hmm. Over, you know, and 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 Bill's thing was he sold. It was in New Jersey, so he wouldn't sell New Jersey tickets. He sold New York tickets. He would forward the New Jersey calls to a, a Delaware office, mm. and so there wasn't a crossover. Of that something happened. I remember. I'll have to check with Bill. I, there was a Phil Rizzuto day at at, at Yankee Stadium, and uh, somehow, uh, oh, what's his name? Not uh, the guy. Uh, not the guy David Schultz slapped. What's the other uh, investor? Oh, uh, oh, Geraldo Rivera. One of those okay, types. Okay, yeah. yeah. It was one of those types. Maybe on a lesser sure. scale, it came. Someone had complained. Whatever. Billy handled it well. Anyway, Pink Face Stanley and Scotty the Baboon. Phantom of the Opera opened. I'm not exact about this. Don't forget, we don't do our research exactly. <laughs> Maybe in 88 or 89. Now we're talking about 91. Mm-hmm. It was still red hot, but it wasn't, you know, ultra red hot. And so in this little cubicle, when you got buzzed in, Bill had a camera. It was very advanced technology at the time, a camera and a microphone mm -hmm. in the front so you could see the people. And he also had one in the back. Oh, okay. So you could see him from behind. In case they were you packing never, heat. Yeah, yeah, you never know, yeah. right? So, um, and I believe he also had one out looking out the door. Anyway, uh, I'm there one day and here the buzzer goes and Ronnie, go, Ronnie says, oh, Jesus Christ, <laughs> these two are here. Now, if Ronnie thinks they're <laughs> bad, it's got, you know, they don't forget that they, 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 they were entitled to in my chapter that my cousin's working on, uh, the name, the title of the chapter about these guys is the worst. The worst, yeah. So if Ronnie's like, so they, so Bill's, so we're in the back, and in Billy's office, you could see and hear it, and uh, and Bill's like, well, they must be here to try to sell something, and Ronnie's like, yeah, they're probably going to try to some unload some kind of crap. So Billy says, yeah, yeah, go out there. See what, see what you could do with them. So Ronnie, they buzz him in. And there's Stanley. And Scotty the Baboon was always like a sidekick, second fiddle. You know, would only say something if, if things uh, got out of hand. So when Ronnie came out to see them, he said something to Stan, to uh, Pigface and the baboon that they probably hadn't heard in, since they were children. You know what that was? Do we have to get the sensor ready? Do we <laughs> no. He <laughs> said, hello, Stanley. How are you? <laughs> hello, Scotty. 
<laughs> Normally on the street, it'd be like, what do you got, pig face? <laughs> Hey, baboon, you got anything for the, you know, you got any rangers? That's how, and they were, but, and so, so Ron, <laughs> hello, Stanley. Kill him with, it, they, it reminds me of Newman. Every time you tell these stories, I picture Newman in my head. That's sort of what the baboon looked like, but worse, oh, way, yeah. way worse. <laughs> so, pig face says, Ronnie. In the, in the in the and he had that pig snout too. Ronnie, ah, ah, I got gold. I got gold here. Now I'm in the back with Bill. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm listening. Oh, you're watching and on the closed circuit. We're yeah. and, yeah. and 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 we're cracking up already. And he, he's like, I got gold. Yeah, you know, the, look. And he had a stack, probably two three hundred Phantom of the Opera tickets. Wow, that was good, but. They were all Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, mm. on like maybe a couple of weekends, lousy rows, yeah. uh, wrong dates. The show had been playing already for two and a half years, and but they still had value. Mm -hmm. And I remember the face value at the time of these tickets was $75, and what was the real value of these? You know, and they were for the future months coming up. Okay. Probably at ten dollars a ticket over the price. Mm -hmm. You could sell them to a, a you know, a guy, a guy like Bill, or what I became, thanks to Bill. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was the right price to pay. You're not gonna pay top dollar. They weren't it, it just it wasn't even like there was, oh. Hey, on, on, on four of the Thursdays, there's some fifth row centers. No, all, mm. all garbage. Yeah. And, and, and Stanley's like, I got gold here, Ronnie. I got gold. So Ronnie's like looking and he's thumbing through them. He's like, oh, Stanley, I, I don't know. I, I see a lot of Tuesdays and Wednesday matinees and Thursday. Oh, yeah, there's a Friday. Oh, row X. I mean, come on, <laughs> Stan it's good, Stanley. I, and Stanley, come on, Ronnie. Come on, Ronnie. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. He goes, I, I'm bringing you gold here. I just want quarters over. Just quarters. Mm -hmm. That was $25 over. Right? So I'm in the back with Bill. And we're just like, this, this is too much. So it was too much financially. And it was too much in the expression of, this is funny. <laughs> so Ronnie's like, well, look, I, I got to show these to the boss. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let me check it out. He goes, Come on, Ronnie. Come on. It's gold here. It's gold here. Now, as he's saying this, the baboon is is like, it, it, you could tell the baboon's ready to, you know, be unleashed. And you could <laughs> see Stanley. Don't forget, there was the rear camera. Right. Stanley stopped it, kick, wow. kicking, his, <laughs> kicking his ankle. Like, <laughs> you know, don't say nothing. Don't say yeah, it. Right? <laughs> kicking his ankle. So when Ronnie brings the tickets to the back. Mm hmm and we're able to examine this pile of junk. Now we could hear them. And the baboon says that this is the way they spoke to each other. As, as if, you, if you hadn't heard the previous episode, uh, it was the, in, in our earlier episode, the baboon says to his father, what the fuck's wrong with you? Why are you asking so much? They're assholes. If you'd have told them $20 a ticket, they would have just taken them. They would have taken them. They would have eaten them out. Of, they would have ate them out of your hands. And and Stanley says to his son, "Shut the fuck up, oh Scotty. Shut the fuck up. Wow. These guys are jerk offs. They're gonna buy them. You'll see. Oh. You'll, and we're here in the whole thing. Yeah. We're here in the whole thing. <laughs> wow. It, 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 there's that famous quote about you know you shouldn't be judged what you do." Public, it's about how you act in private, and they clearly thought well, they had no idea. <laughs> they, they, like, me, right? they had no idea. So oh now, so now Billy's like, Billy's like, first of all, we knew all knew better that they certainly weren't worth 25 over, yeah, or, tw or 20 over. Mm -hmm. And Billy's like, and, and and Ronnie was rough and tough. Ronnie's Ronnie says to Bill, he goes, you want to just give them 10 over, and I'll, I'll just you know, I'll play around with them, and we'll, you know, that'll be worth it. And, and Billy's like, no, no, no. Tell him we don't want him. Wow. So he goes back. He goes back. And 
we heard this how how you know they're they're telling between each other that these guys are jerk offs. Oh. These guys will buy them. <laughs> Don't worry. Oh, so when Ronnie comes back, he says, "Stanley, uh, twenty five is a little bit high <laughs> on these." <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I don't really think that he, we could use him. Well, this this sent the, the, the baboon the, the baboon couldn't contain himself anymore. Pig face is going like, but Ronnie, Ronnie, I brought you gold here. I brought you gold. What are you doing to me? You know, we we got these ourselves. You think we would send other guys to the window? And the baboon let loose with like a primal like. <laughs> Me and my daddy bought these seats. Me and daddy oh bought goodness. these seats. You think we send these other bums to the window? He was talking about the diggers. Yeah. You think we send these other bums to the window? We handpicked these for you, Ronnie. <laughs> Me and daddy. And you, you, you're going to fuck them like this? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> And you're still so, here all this. Right. Well, <laughs> so and we're, me and Bill are back. We're laughing. So Ronnie says, well, uh, let me just go ask the boss. Take him in the, bring him in the back. Now, what these guys are saying to each other, I mean, they're just cursing each other out. They, they have still, they have no idea. They're, and this is, to repeat, this is father-son, father-son duo. Right. You know, so now after they learning that they may not sell them at all, you know, the baboon is like, you're a fucking asshole. Oh you know, you keep, and they're, they're like, fuck you, fuck you. Fuck. Wow. It was horrible. And so <laughs> Billy had a good solution. You know what? Offer him nickels. Wow. Five dollars to take it over. Yeah. And Ronnie's like, let him stew for a little while. <laughs> and we're listening to these guys arguing each other and, say, and and insulting the office, you know, that Ronnie's a scumbag. Oh, God. He's just, how dare they do this, you know? <laughs> well, Ronnie finally said, Bill's like, just go out there, Ray. So <laughs> Ronnie goes, here, here, Stan. And he goes, I, I, he goes, Ronnie, Ronnie. Uh, he goes, just give us dimes. Give us dimes. Come on. We come to you first. We could have brought these to somebody else. Give me, uh, and the, ba the baboons. He goes, Daddy, no. No, get more, <laughs> more from them. He'll pay more. <laughs> Daddy. <laughs> and, he, and, and at this point, the baboon, uh, Stanley, <laughs> big face turned around and said, and it's with Ronnie right there. Said, Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the fuck up! He goes, all right, come on, Ronnie, dive! Just dives over! He goes, we're practically into him for that! So Ronnie's like, look, Stan, we'll give you five of five dollars a ticket over. <laughs> <laughs> and they were stuck. Yeah. They cursed some more, they argued some more, <laughs> they screamed some more, they they said you're screwing us some more. But then finally, uh, and then finally, Stanley gave <laughs> Stanley gave little Scotty his son one last kick in the leg, <laughs> so he just wouldn't completely insult him. He go, "All right, Ronnie, give me the money. <laughs> give me the fucking money. God damn it! You're fucking us here. You're fucking us here. <laughs> give me the money." So they took the uh, they got their seventy five dollars a ticket. Plus five dollars a ticket over. Yeah, and uh, out they went. Um, <laughs> in the interim, while they were while they were waiting uh, for the cash, uh, Bill made them wait a long time. <laughs> Good for Bill. These these guys are screaming at each other. Uh, it Any. was it was just a classic. Maybe this video exists somewhere. Maybe. Do you think he saved it? I don't know. Maybe I'll have to I... check with Billy. Yeah. But uh, those are some tales from Union Tickets. Bill Bill, Bill was a savior for me. Uh, once again, I see him. He's gone into the photography business. He does beautiful work. Uh, he lives, he's got a beautiful house uh, right, right across the ocean in Belmar. Mm. And he does really nice work. Mm -hmm. uh, McKim's Photography, it's online. Really good stuff. And uh, if it wasn't for him, 
he was one of the reasons that, uh, you know, I was able to get off the street and uh, move along in my life. So I'm eternally grateful for union tickets. Yeah. And Ronnie, uh, funny thing was, when I opened up my office, Rave Review, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. more than that, 22 years ago, Ronnie used to call. But, you know, Bill got rid of Ronnie at some point. Mm -hmm. There were just too many headaches. And uh, Ronnie used to call me up, ask like, like, and I knew it was him. He'd be like, you know, whatever. Elton John would go on sale for the girl. What do, what do you got? I'm like, Ronnie. He was just, he was nuts. But uh, crazy times. They don't make characters like these anymore. <laughs> uh, Billy was a great, Billy was a great character. He got involved in the ticket business through t-shirts originally. Wow. And, and yeah, you know, which Dustin. Mm -hmm. And uh, then into tickets. And once again, he's into photography. Ronnie, I don't know where he is or if he's with us anymore, but uh, he was a classic. What yeah. a classic guy. And Stanley and Scotty, yeah. <laughs> two more classics. And poor Helen Economou. Yeah, Helen Economou and E. Girk and, and e. the Girk family. So and, uh... we gave you a little bit of a lighter <laughs> podcast. If you're dying for some wrestling stuff, we're going to be coming back at you with some really good things. Uh, I know we're going to tell the story of uh, my dealings with Ric Flair coming yeah. up soon. We will be. And and I know next week we'll be taking a break. Uh, we're taking yes. a little vacation. Ian's uh, going on vacation. Hooray. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, the, it, hopefully, I mean, you know, the intent is to rest up. Ring of Honor is kicking things around. Don't want to rush into it, though. We're seeing what's happening with some of the other companies right now. But there's been some really good content Ring of Honor has been putting out and yeah, a lot absolutely. of new matches. Yep. Um, some classics folks haven't seen before because the DVDs weren't as available. That's right. So, yeah, Honor Club, ROHHonorClub.com. You can see you can see some cameos every time the world title changes hands. Carrie yes. Sook. And <laughs> I was also included in, in this 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 week's week to week. Yes. ROH week to week. In yeah. the uh, best. Uh, on your on who's your favorite wrestler yeah and tonight uh this is being released on a friday tonight is the very best of best in the world so if you're listening on the friday this is dropped pay-per-view honor club uh gonna have a, i believe at least seven matches of the best of best is that in the, world. the one where i'm on you fly in yes, yes. your head you are a disembodied head that flies in <laughs> right on throughout the night so it's a really fun event uh, seven matches including kyle o'reilly versus adam cole uh, one of my favorites that I, was violent hybrid rules Adam Cole's Ooh. mad no spoilers but a lot of blood on that one and uh, it, maybe one of my favorite matches of all time Jay Briscoe Jay Lethal both titles on the line yes and uh, that's, that was the one I commented on yes yeah so that's uh, that's a fun night uh, there's going to be those matches most of which you've seen before but your favorite stars of Ring of Honor will be flying in throughout the night pop up video style so it'll be, uh, be a lot of fun it's free for all Honor Club members so and if it's the first time you're coming across this, please subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Uh, we have a couple of t-shirts, the last stop Penn Station, Penn Station t-shirt, as well as the He Eats Breakfast, the Camel. <laughs> and uh, if, if, you know, the, these stories with these characters, um, if you like this, then please go, and you're just discovering this, Please go back and check out some of these earlier episodes because they're loaded with these kind of characters that I'm afraid as time erodes, uh, these characters are going to are going to be lost. I was listening to Dutch Mantel and I've mentioned this before and he has a, he has a good podcast again and uh, University of Dutch mm -hmm. and uh, Dutch is older than me. You know, I. I I think he's about seven, eight years older than me. I mean, he was wrestling. Geez, his career was from the early 70s. Right. And uh, great, great behind the scenes guy. But the point of what I'm saying is Dutch has so many stories. And I have some stories with Dutch, but which we told in the Puerto Rico episode. Mm -hmm. But the point is, if these stories aren't told, they are going to die. Right. When the parties die so we need to get these out we need to preserve these stories uh 
like Jigsaw said to me, at least that, and, and Bryce Rensburg, mm-hmm. that Larry Sweeney episode will be around forever. Yeah. You know, in some form. So it's good to chronicle these. And uh, we appreciate the support we've gotten doing this. We love doing it. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you, AJ of Bassan Creative, who's been uh, wonderful. And uh, you have a good vacation. <laughs> uh, thank you. Appreciate it. I'll be enjoying, enjoying the sun. And we'll see you in two weeks. Enjoy best of best in the world tonight if you have Honor Club or order it on pay-per-view. And Carrie and I will see you in about two weeks. Maybe we'll talk about Ric Flair. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about uh, Samoa Joe and Kobashi, that that famous night. Yeah. That's, you know, we, we're going to have to go over some of my great uh, the, the matches. Uh, you know, we spoke about the garden, but yeah, that, that would, that could be a podcast. Um, there, there, we have, we have a lot. We yeah. have a lot. Um, besides, you know, I, I want to do flair and concurrent with flair. who's not a good story. And it was not nice to me. Uh, there were guys that were very nice, like Bret Hart. Yeah. And, and Bruno, Bruno's, Bruno. yeah, we talked about Madison Square Garden. How can we not talk about the uh, the man that sold you it know, out more than anybody else? Not to mention the polarizing, but nevertheless, brilliant Jim Cornette. Right. Who's, uh, you know, one of the main, one of the main reasons that uh, we got the Sinclair deal with Ring of Honor. So yeah. we got plenty to talk about, my man. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to it. We'll see you in two weeks. And thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Last Stop Penn Station. Happy wrestling, everybody. listening to Last Stop Penn Station Podcast. Rate, review, like, subscribe, and share on your favorite platform. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or at laststoppennstation.com.